Let's wrap up tonight with a talk about environmental stresses on trees. And a number of stresses are showing up now and here to discuss some of the recent symptoms and offer suggestions on how to manage these issues is Dr. Joe Zlesnick. Joe has been with NDSU Extension since 2002 as a forestry specialist. He works throughout North Dakota and in the intersection of prairie and forest in Western Minnesota. Joe focuses on tree species diversity in communities, as well as he has work on pest management and tree ring analysis. So Joe, welcome to the forums. Tonight I'm going to talk about environmental stresses of trees. So there's a lot of different things we could talk about tonight. I'm actually only going to focus on three. Uh, drought because, well, we're coming off of two years of very bad drought. There's still uh, some question that we might uh, have a little bit of drought issues this year, maybe. Uh, of course, winter issues because it's been a long winter. And flooding because now we're getting into flooding so i'm going to focus on these three items so first of all with drought uh what did we see in the last two years of course we saw growth just slowed down that's what trees do they they compensate internally if there's not enough water to grow they won't grow yes they may die and they may have insect and disease issues but mostly they just slow down and there is going to be some slower growth in the next year or two because it does take some time to recover from a drought and like i said that drought can be associated with specific pests the two most common are valsa canker of spruce trees uh, we used to call that cytosper canker the name has been changed and bronze birch borer and i want to point out here valsa canker what this does it's a fungus that lives within the tree and during drought, drought is very associated with this, the fungus uh, becomes more active. It, it sits in the tree as an endophyte. That is, it's a fungus that lives in the tree without causing any issues at all until the tree gets drought stressed. And when the tree gets drought stressed, this fungus will then form a canker around the base of that branch and it'll kill the branch. It can kill whole trees. Uh, this is very common. And the only treatment really is prevention. Yes, you can cut out dead branches. You should cut out dead branches. But the only treatment really is prevention and make sure those spruce trees are properly watered. Spruce are very interesting in that they can't take flooding, but they can't take drought because of the, of the valsa canker. So keep them properly, uh, properly watered. What is properly? Well, you don't want the, the roots soaking wet. Put it that way, you know, a good moist soil will be good for spruce trees. The other one that's the other pest that's very commonly associated with drought stress is bronze birch borer. Uh, this is a birch tree in Carrington and the top is all died back. And I went up and I looked at the, the trunk of the tree and the tree was mostly dead. So I cut the brain, I cut the trunk open, cut the, the bark off it. And here's what I found. I found galleries, tunnels from an insect called bronze birch borer. This is a native insect to North Dakota, native insect to the US, and it attacks birch trees, especially those white barked birch trees, paper birch trees, and other white barked birch trees. And I found this so interesting, not only were there tunnels, but I could also see where the tree had started to grow over those tunnels and the tree had started to heal itself following this attack. Uh, it was really neat. What I often see from the outside are these types of symptoms. On the right, you see this, <coughs> excuse me, I'm just getting over a cold here. Uh, I see this, what I call muscling of the wood. Uh, it's kind of a ropey, uh, yeah, ropey muscled look or texture of the branch. The bark itself is still overall, it's pretty smooth, but you get this ropiness. And what's going on there is that's where underneath there the insects have made those tunnels and the tree is growing over them on the left these are the exit holes of the insect they're the shape of a capital letter d and uh that's very common uh because you might have heard of that from the from the emerald ash borer that hits ash trees well this is a related species the bronze birch borer that hits birch trees and again, the biggest treatment here is prevention. 
Um, how do you know what to do? How do you know if the tree has Valsa canker or bronze birch borer? Uh, do observations, you know, check them out and, and do your scouting. Treatment is really preventative, mostly. For bronze birch borer, there are some chemical insecticides that can be used that can be injected into the stem of the tree. They can be very effective if the tree is not heavily infested. If the tree can take in the chemical from the injections, then the tree, uh, I'll say, can be saved. Um, you know, if a tree's not heavily infested, just give it a proper watering can help it out. It can do a world of good for it. Excuse me. Uh, and that's all I really want to cover with drought. Uh, not a whole lot there. However, winter issues. Uh, and I, I've got this kind of a broad overview. I call it winter issues here. And, you know, the first slide here, this is uh, animal damage, not really environmental. And those are arborvitae trees there on the left. And deer have just hammered those. On the right, it was rabbits that girdled that tree. Uh, I think it was a crab apple tree. And yeah, that, that crab apple tree is dead. I, I got a question earlier today about rabbits that had girdled a crab apple tree. Uh, was the tree going to die? Yes, it is. Uh, on the left, the arborvitae. Are those going to recover? Well, yeah, that's a good question. Um, where the deer have eaten them, there are no more buds. There are very few buds. And without buds, they're not going to produce new foliage. So there's going to be new foliage above that area and below that area. But in the middle, there's still going to be that gap mainly. So uh, is that amount that's still alive above that dead area, is that enough to support those trees? You know, I'm not really sure. Uh, it looks like very little is left to me. Um, I actually took that photo like 10 years ago. I should go back there and check it out. So winter issues. There can be many. And one thing we commonly talk about is what's called winter injury of conifers. And winter injury is actually a really vague term because there can be many causes, there can be many symptoms. And basically around this time of year, I've gotten a few calls already, uh, we see just brown needles on trees. Now this is a, a very specific special example of winter injury where uh, all those seedlings and there's little saplings there in the front, in the foreground, everything above the snowpack has uh, been affected. Everything below the snowpack is still alive. Okay. These are Austrian pine trees in a little nursery on campus many years ago. And uh, those needles that were above the snowpack died. Uh, I don't know if it was really sunny. It warmed up. I don't know if it was really windy. I don't know what happened, but it they died. Everything below that uh, was killed. That said, all those trees, the buds survived, so they were sending out new growth. So that's just one form of winter injury. Uh, another one, sometimes we see this on spruce trees, and there's no pattern to it. Uh, yes, this one it shows all of this most recent year's growth is affected. Sometimes it's just the opposite. Sometimes it's last year's growth or the third year growth, or sometimes it's the bottom of the branches or just the top or just the east side or, or just the southwest side. It can be very random. And what can you do? Well, not a whole lot because at this point, the damage is already done. So um, basically, you just got to wait it out and let the tree grow out of it or it won't. Uh, with my own tree that suffers this every few years, my own ponderosa pine. Yes, it gets damaged in uh, years where there's a, a high, highly variable spring temperatures. And so we see, a pro we see an issue then. Uh, and it just grows out of it over time. So hang in there. One thing we saw a lot of this year was just plain physical damage from the snow. And this was a little different. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we, had a lot of, we had a lot of snow. And a lot of it was wet, heavy snow. And what happens here, this is my own ponderosa pine tree in my yard. And that top leader is just bent right over. What can you do? Well, what I ended up doing is I got a, out a big, big, long pole and knocked off that snow, got the, the weight off. And you know what? 
it it started to straighten itself up and i'm going to be very curious to see what happens this year so what can you do if you really want to do something you can splint the top of a tree now this is i believe it was a hackberry tree but you can splint the top of a tree you can do this with a conifer or anything else uh to get a one main leader and you just get a a big long bamboo pole and get some cloth strips and tie them up along the stem and uh, tie that leader onto it and that can help to straighten it out you might need to leave it on there for a year maybe two but but no longer than that take off that splint over time and uh, i could do that to my tree but i'm i'm choosing to not do it and i'm going to see if it's going to come back straight or if it's going to have a little curve uh, along the stem it's going to be interesting now if the top was broken well really then the only thing we could do is is prune it back and let one of the side branches take over as a leader and then we could train that branch into uh more of a central leader as best we can we also saw a lot of this uh these are arborvitaes but also junipers were showing this uh, especially these upright cultivars where there's not just one central stem there's several and they just kind of peeled open like an onion uh what do you do what do you do and really uh each situation is unique sometimes you can do nothing and they'll be fine sometimes and sometimes the best thing is to get rid of them unfortunately so each situation is different i will say this uh, if branches are broken remove them and use some proper pruning techniques there should be no topping of trees uh, especially these conifers because they're not going to come back if they get topped the other thing is you can draw those branches or stems back together you, and i will say this if you use a rope, use it to draw them back together. But really what we want to do is strap them together. Uh, and uh, don't put the rope directly on the stem. Use the rope to draw the straps together because the straps provide support and we're cushioning the, the stem. Uh, we're not going to rub against the stem. Although I do say, I will say that bungee cords might be okay uh, because they 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 flex you know they they provide some support but they will also flex but i want to point out in terms of drawing these stems back together uh this is going to be a long-term situation that uh you need to do this for at least a year or two and maybe even three or four years before that stem has built up enough strength enough new wood before it can support itself so something to consider there so that's the physical damage. There's no guarantees on if this will work or not. Each situation uh, is unique. And do nothing is always an option, something to consider. One thing you may see, uh, I want to point out here, is something called frost cracks. Uh, these are cracks that form along the stem of a tree. Usually it's a, uh, usually it's a deciduous tree. I don't know that I've really seen this much on conifers, if at all. And sometimes it's on the southwest side. This one is actually on the east side of the tree. Uh, this is an ash tree in the city of Dilworth, Minnesota. And this one is huge. It goes all the way from the bottom of the tree, uh, 15 feet up. And what happens here is during extremely cold weather, and when I say extremely cold, we're, we're getting down to 25 to 35 below. Sometimes the stem will just pop open. It'll just break right open. It'll, it'll sound like a gunshot. And that tree just cracks. And what happens, this is the southwest side of the tree. And you can see there's a, a break over here as well. What happens? Uh, physically, uh, we're still trying to figure it out all these years later. Uh, it could be that the stem shrinks and breaks. It could be that the stem swells and breaks. Regardless, this is what happens. And do these uh, do these cracks grow over? Do they heal themselves? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, sometimes they will grow over. The the tissue will heal back together, and you'll get a frost rib. And sometimes it just keeps opening and closing every winter. 
So it's really variable. I've seen these on cherry trees, uh, birch trees, aspen trees, uh, ash trees, maple trees, a lot of different deciduous trees this happens. And really there's nothing we can do except wait it out. Unfortunately, sometimes these are entry places uh, for for the fungi that will, will decay the tree. So some of the pests. So it's uh, unfortunate, but it does happen. So very briefly, there's a little bit of winter injury. Let's get ready for flooding now, because that's going to happen. Uh, very likely, what's the prediction? Well, let's see. In central North Dakota, here are the predictions. Uh, chances of, of greater than 50% chance of moderate flooding is in red. Uh, greater than 50% chance of minor flooding is in orange. Okay, it's, uh, it's a little bit mixed. Less than 50% chance of flooding is green. Okay, so it's a little bit mixed bag in central North Dakota and along the Soros River, central and north. Uh, in eastern North Dakota, yeah, it's a, a little more clear that it's going to be either some moderate to major flooding this year, uh, greater than 50% chance. Of course, it depends on how fast the snow melts and we'll see what happens. But what does this mean for the trees? Well, tolerance to flooding really depends on a bunch of different factors. Specifically, the timing of the flood or the and, and the duration of the flood. So this is an example from the Red River, 2010 in March. What do you see on those trees? Anything? No. No, they're dormant. The trees are dormant. Uh, it was actually really early in 2010 actually 2009 was even earlier uh, at the end of february or mid-march rather so how about if it floods in june and all those trees are in leaf uh that makes a little bit of a difference there so that's something to consider uh so what really that means is are the trees dormant or not if trees are dormant quite frankly they'll do fine uh, conifers generally can't handle flooding, okay? Especially those spruce trees, uh, arborvitae are a little different. They can actually handle a little bit of flooding. They are a swamp species, but the spruce trees, the pine trees, they cannot handle flooding unless they're dormant. If they're dormant, it's not a big deal. If, if you go to Minot these days and look in that area that was flooded in 2011, Look to see how many conifers you find in those neighborhoods. You're not going to find many because that flood happened in midsummer and those trees were not dormant and they died pretty quickly. So a part of this and then is also related to species. Okay, uh, this was 2011 in Bismarck and this was um, uh, Megan Mirdal was the county agent back then. She took these photos. I'm trying to remember if these were junipers or if these were arborvitaes. Um, can't remember for sure. But again, in 2011, from or in the areas that were flooded in 2011 in Bismarck, you're not going to find many conifers there anymore. When I went back to this area in 2012, this is there, the Fox Island area of Bismarck. So um, kind of south of the golf course, south of the, of the zoo. This was interesting to see that a lot of the Russian olive got knocked back that was flooded in 2011, yet the cottonwood trees were fine. So it can be species dependent. And the cottonwood trees not only were fine, this was with a couple feet of sediment on the soil. It was pretty amazing what we saw after that flood. So if you want some more information about flooding and trees, we do have a publication helping flooded trees and shrubs. Uh, very briefly, it talks about some of the symptoms and what are some of the recovery actions that you can do uh, to take care of trees after flooding. And there are some tables on the back page of this uh, with both trees and shrubs, and there are different abilities to tolerate or inability to tolerate flooding. So if you have more questions, look at look for H, what was it, H1592. All right, so one other thing um, I want to point out here is the weather afterwards. This was also an issue following the 2011 floods in Bismarck. 
waterlogged soil, and then there were big windstorms and trees got knocked over left and right. And this was really sad. Um, and was there anything people could do? No, not really. So what we can just do is be aware that this could be an issue. If the soil's waterlogged and then we get big heavy winds afterwards, um, be careful. Be careful. This is going to be a problem. And I think actually that's all i have tonight it's actually a very quick little uh, uh quick little coverage of just a few of the major environmental stresses of course there are much more we could talk about winter dehardening which we saw in birch trees back in 2021 uh where we get these really variable temperatures in the spring we could talk about early frost or late late frost excess heat soil issues um there's a lot that Mother Nature throws at the trees, and um, we could go for a long, long time. But with that, I'm going to set this aside and see what kind of questions there are. Okay. Joe, there's a question about the frost cracks. Do both younger and older trees suffer from frost cracks? You know, I've usually seen them on trees that are bigger, older. I would say maybe uh, 10 to 12 inches diameter and bigger. I don't know that I've really seen them on smaller trees. Okay, how about uh, this person's young junipers are completely covered by snow. Mm -hmm. What can they expect? Well, it depends on a lot of different things. Uh, are these shrub junipers? Are they uh, tree junipers? Um, if they're covered by snow, is it a heavy wet snow? Is it a light snow? Uh, there's a lot of different things that could be going on. That said, uh, if it's just they're simply covered and there's no other issues, well, they'll grow out of it. They'll, you know, it'll warm up, the snow will melt, and they'll grow just fine. They should. Okay. I got more information on those junipers. They're the uh, classic sea green juniper. I'm trying to remember, is that I've heard of that cultivar? Trying to remember if it's a tree or a shrub. Oh, it's a shrub. It's a common yeah. shrub. You okay. yeah. foundation planting. Yeah. Um, you know, if physically it could, the weight of the snow could knock that down, crush it a little bit, but uh, generally they they should be fine. Okay. Uh, this person has a William Baffin rose bush and it, the rabbits ate the top of it. Do you think the plant will? I have Survive? no idea about roses. Um, I, I, how long, it, I, my guess would be it would depend on how long it's been established and it, if it does have a, a good root system established, whether or not it will come back. Yeah, that William Baffin is a, that's a tough explorer rose, very hardy rose. Mm -hmm. um, and it should come back from, it, it looks like they didn't, the, the, the snow protected the lower portion sure. of the row. So it looks like just kind of what you showed there, Joe, with that uh, tree that was at a crab apple or an apple tree that got totally girdled around the. Yep. It's just kind of like that kind of situation that everything sure. above that's going to eventually die off. Right. Okay. Uh, well, let's see here. Here we go. There's a west-facing shelter belt filled with snow from November till now. The 15-foot junipers and the spruce are leaning. And now with the melting snow, the branches are snapping off. Would you start mm -hmm. pruning the injured branches? If you can get to them, sure. Uh, if you can get to them, prune them back to, a, to where there's a connecting point with the main stem or a previous branch. Um, if, if you can't, you know, they could probably wait till next fall before you prune, but yeah, get in there, prune those out if as best you can. Okay, this person has a, a two year old silver maple. It budded, then there was a cold snap and it didn't get many leaves. Yep. Now last year they got more leaves and there were some insects on the trunk. Any idea about the, the future of this young silver maple? Well, Is it going to survive? It had just a few leaves last year. Just a few leaves. Uh, 
you know, the, the tree needs a lot of leaves to survive. I am very curious. The Going first, I'll, I'll do the insects because that's that's actually pretty easy. Uh, there are so many insects around here that hit so many trees. Usually they're not a big problem. Um, you know, if we're talking on the, the leaves of silver maple, what I'm wondering if those are like a, a bladder gall mite or a spindle gall, um, you know, without seeing the leaf, uh, I'm something I usually don't worry about. That said, trees need the leaves to survive. And if they're getting damaged by a late spring frost uh, and, and or, like you said, they, they budded out early. That's one thing one thing that silver maples tend to do is they will, they'll start to grow leaves early and then it gets cold again. And it's not really a frost per se. It's uh, that they break dormancy really early. And that's really hard on trees growing in the Northern Plains. They need to stay dormant for longer. And that's one of the challenges I know that Dr. West has and anybody that's selecting trees for, for release here in the Northern Plains is the trees have to stay dormant. So back in 2021, what we saw throughout most of North Dakota is a lot of the birch trees had their tops die back. Uh, this was Dakota Pinnacle, uh, Parkland Pillar, some of the Asian white birch, some of the European white birch, uh, the weeping white European white birch, their tops all died back. And what we traced that back to was a warm spell we had in February, the trees, de-hardened and once it got cold again they couldn't re-harden this happened throughout the state so that may have happened to the silver maple and it's going to need a couple years to recover if it does recover joe do you have kind of like a general rule about like a defoliation defoliation of trees and shrubs like if they get defoliated one year can they survive can they survive sure. after defoliation two years? Sure. Okay, as a general rule of thumb, if a tree is otherwise healthy, I'm going to start it out with that. If the tree is otherwise healthy, it can handle and is, well, let me back up. If a, if a deciduous tree is otherwise healthy and it gets defoliated in one year, maybe there's uh, either a late spring frost or we get like canker worm infestation which can also defoliate trees. Um, yeah, one year, not a big deal. It can handle it. Uh, it will send out new leaves. The crown might be thinner for that year, but it should recover just fine. I remember seeing a an elm tree in my neighbor's yard one year after a spring frost. It was very thin that year. That crown was thin. The following year, it was fine. It was a nice thick full crown again. Okay. If a tree is otherwise healthy, it might be able to take that two years in a row. Um, but once you start getting to a third year, boy, that's a big stress on a tree. Okay. And I, I, like I said, I'm going to give a big caveat there. If the tree is otherwise healthy, yep. because there's a lot of different things that can hit trees. Yeah, that's good. How about, uh, Joe, you talked about drought. Can you recommend shrubs that will tolerate dry soil? Oh, geez. Um, the junipers are what come to mind off the top of my head. Um, I don't often think about drought tolerant shrubs. Uh, believe it's funny earlier with Todd question came up about sand cherry. Right. Um, sand cherry can handle that kind of, of environment. And I'd say if you go to Western North Dakota and look at some of the native shrubs out there, you're going to find a lot of very drought tolerant species. Um, they're tough. Yeah, like Pontel is native. Yes, that would be a one. That'd be a, that's a pretty tough one. Mm -hmm. How about uh, got a mugo pine shrub, twenty five years old. The rabbits chewed on, uh, but then they screened in the area, and they, the rabbits didn't get to it after that. So the screen area, they didn't get to be in the area last. So they've the shrub's been okay for a couple of years. Oh, so good. sounds like it's gonna make it. Sure. Yep. How about uh, a four four foot juniper tree 
the leader died off during the winter. Mm -hmm. They trimmed it off. Is there a way to reshape it or create a second leader? Uh, basically, I'd say wait to see what the tree does to start to create a new leader and then make your decisions. Um, if, if there's one branch that's coming up and you want to encourage that, yes, you can turn it upright and splint it like I showed in that one photo. Uh, if there are multiple leaders, multiple branches that come up to become competing leaders, then you may have to make some decisions on which ones to trim and which one or maybe two to keep. So I'd say first observe and then make your decisions. Joel, this person has a boulevard tree. They just planted it in late September in Bismarck. And they're just wondering, like, what should they be looking for to make sure that it's doing well? And sh should they be watering it for on a regular basis, for example, using those tr those tree bags, those gator you know, bags? I'd say uh, wait and see what, what nature gives for moisture. If you're getting uh, an inch a week, or two inches in two weeks, the tree should be fine. Um, but wait and see. And I wouldn't give it more than an inch a week. Uh, depending on the size, as a rough rule of thumb, a one inch diameter tree, one inch diameter stem, the tree can use three gallons of water a day in the summer. A uh, two inch diameter would go for six gallons of water a day. I wouldn't water it every day. I'd water it once a week or maybe once every two weeks and just soak soak it in soak that water in and let the tree slowly take it up and if you're wondering about uh, the soil moisture you can use a screwdriver stick it in the ground uh, just feel the soil whether it's dry or moist or wet if it's wet don't water if it's moist don't water if it's dry water okay joe this person's got a a rip it's uh, autumn blaze maple, 24 years old, it says, and uh, it's got cracks in the trunk. Mm -hmm. um, they, now they're, they've wrapped the trunk and it seems to be recuperating. But now the leaves seem to be more yellowish green in the summer. Mm -hmm. So does, they, should they give a tree <laughs> a shot of something? or? Yeah, autumn blaze is, uh, is, is not the greatest tree to grow in North Dakota. I'm surprised you've had one survive for 24 years <coughs> excuse me uh auto blaze is very sensitive to iron chlorosis and our high ph soils we have plenty of iron in the soil but it's just not available as as well and autumn blaze maple some of the silver maples as well as uh, red maple which is one of the parents of autumn blaze uh, are all sensitive to iron chlorosis so if a tree is showing symptoms then yes it should be treated with some type of iron treatment uh, we have a publication on iron chlorosis i don't have the the number off the top of my head but if you look for uh, ndsu extension uh, iron chlorosis in trees there will give some we have some great information there on how to treat it there are soil treatments there are foliar treatments as well as stem injections that can help the tree Okay, Joe, this person has a question about, we're back on a William Baff and Rose again now, and they've got, uh, what's the best spray for pests? So if someone gives you that question, what's your answer? What's the best uh, spray for pests? Boy, I'd say that's a, my answer would be, <laughs> you have to be very specific about which pests. That's right. And uh, there's, there are fungal pests, there are insect pests, and there are animal pests too. So uh, I would say, scout observe and, and learn what the pests are and then treat them that's right you got to know your enemy for your attack how about joe you know there's an old saying that under a conifer you can't grow anything underneath it because it's acidic soil but other people mm -hmm. say that it takes hundreds of years for the soil to change and the biggest the problem underneath the conifer is there's not enough light or water mm -hmm. so but spruce can't take flooding. So, right. so where's the balance in all this? Is And is there <laughs> any truth in that ass acidity of the soil is killing yeah. off all those undergrowth? The acidity, um, the, to, to change substantially, 
does take hundreds of years that you know maybe in a, in a thin layer a quarter of an inch thick there might be a, a change in acidity under a tree in one generation but that's it um you really to to do any substantial change in the soil acidity would take hundreds of years uh it is more of an issue with light and light availability uh if you want to grow something under a conifer um yeah good luck you get something that's shade tolerant actually my wife and i are trying this right now we've planted uh some hostas she wants to try hostas underneath the the spruce trees out front so we'll give it a shot and i do have to give them a little extra water okay we'll just end on this there's uh this person has several mature black hill spruce that are leaning due to high winds so these are mature trees so now should they pull them back to be to straighten them out you know this is a this is a tough question um there's no easy answer here uh if they've if the root system has actually popped a little bit um it's going to be tough for those things to survive but they might uh it's really your choice whether or not to do it you can either push them back up straight you can pull them back up straight or some combination but you're, you're going to need to provide that support for several years while the roots reestablish and the stem reestablishes re its strength um or you can lay, leave them leaning and from that point forward then they'll go straight up there's a a beautiful old blue spruce tree on the grounds of the Williston Research Extension Center and one of the houses there that's looks like this for about 20 feet and then the next 30 or 40 feet are straight up so that tree got tipped many many years ago and then it grew straight from that point forward so it's really your call yeah that's called character just like that beard of yours, Joe. It's character. Character. You know? It's yes, character. A leaning tree is just adding a little character to the tree. It doesn't have to be straight and perfect. It's not, it's got no character. Joe, thank you for your presentation tonight. We really enjoyed it. You're thank very you. welcome. Thank you for having me. Oh, sure. Always welcome, Joe. Okay, that's it for tonight. That's it for our Spring Fever Garden Forums for this year. Again, I will shortly send an email to the at-home registrants with a link to do a short survey. We'll keep that survey open for a couple weeks, and I really would appreciate any input from you. And same at the county offices, if you could complete that form, that would also be appreciated. So there you go. It feels like finally spring has arrived. And so now that spring is here, and as we head into the summer, please know that NDSU Extension is here to help you. If you there's, have any questions about caring for your landscapes or your gardens, please let us know. So everybody have a good night and a happy spring to all. Mm -hmm.